going through very difficult times in in this region, and um, and it's not immediately clear what the way out of this uh, stagnation or recession uh, is for the region. So that's that's really what the what the book is is uh, is about. And and uh, so I'm going to um, I'll just wave the book again. It's uh, it's a volume published by. Um, St. Anthony's College at, at Oxford. Um, there is a group within St. Anthony's College called uh, CSOC, Southeast European Studies, uh, at Oxford. And I have a, uh, a link. I'm a, I'm a CSOC associate in addition to my work at the uh, EBRD. So I'm one of the editors of this volume, and I have a, a chapter uh, in it as well. So I'm going to uh, focus my remarks uh, um, uh, around this volume and with the help of a few charts and, and, and so on, to try and convey the main, the main points and then come up with some conclusions uh, at, at the end. Okay, now, um, just to uh, <coughs> emphasize that uh, the region, I think, does need uh, a, a, a new reform uh, agenda. The, the current short-term growth outlook is, is, uh, is very uh, weak, uh, for the region. I think the traditional macroeconomic policy levers, fiscal and monetary policy, there's, there's very little or no scope for using them to try and boost uh, growth. Um, the banking system, uh, I think, is still vulnerable to some extent, although I would say that it has, uh, it has actually coped remarkably well with the last four or five years of uh, uh, economic difficulties, but we, uh, it, it cannot be the driver of growth that it was uh, before the crisis. So there is really, I think, a, a need now to look, um, to look at sort of deeper structural reforms. And, and, and I think if those uh, problems that I think were overlooked during the pre-crisis boom years, if those problems can be addressed, then I think uh, the region can get back to sustainable growth. So although indeed I was the author of this epilogue that Tony was uh, started off by quoting, and uh, we were joking it must have been, I must have been in a bad mood when I started the first paragraph, but by the end of the epilogue I think we, you know, I, I, I did say, and, and, and we do believe, I think, that the editors and authors of this book, that, uh, that this region can get back to, uh, uh, get back on the growth path and it can be a more sustainable growth model in, in, the, uh, in the future. Um, a few more words about the book. It's, it's just published. We had an event at Oxford uh, about three weeks ago. <coughs> and um, So a formal launch. It is available on the uh, CSOX website. Uh, it can be downloaded for free. It's not a very large volume. It's about 100, 110 pages. Um, so not too much of a burden on your printer. Um, the uh, the authors are a mixture of uh, some people from the region, um, so a couple of academics, one from Bosnia and Herzegovina, one from Serbia, also a chapter by uh, the governor of the National Bank of Albania, um, Ardian Falani, and his uh, head of research. And then there are a couple of chapters, one by myself and a colleague, <clears throat> from the EBRD and one by two IMF uh, uh, colleagues. And the, the chapters cover the uh, five themes listed there in the third bullet. So the political economy, the region competitiveness, um, trade, uh, trade openness, um, financial uh, sector issues and financial constraints to growth, and foreign uh, direct investment. And of course, with, with different authors, it's... Um, not so easy to to identify, you know, a, a common themes. But I think one theme that does emerge is um, that the region needs, um, partly because of the weak, evident weaknesses now of the European Union, the uh, the region and the, the individual countries need greater domestic ownership of the reform process, but also within a regional context. And by that, we want to emphasise that uh, the more countries within the region can cooperate and portray themselves to the world as one common region rather than lots of little countries that happen to be beside each other, that then I think the, the better their prospects for attracting investment and, uh, and ultimately um, getting back to economic, economic growth. 
Okay, so with that preamble, let me. Uh, the rest of my presentation will uh, be mainly some uh, charts, some uh, familiar, although updated from uh, previous presentations I've, I've given here uh, in the institute. So I, I just want to show you two charts first that highlight the the current malaise. One is um, the current. Whoops, sorry, I've gone too fast. There. Uh, the current uh, growth outlook. So. Uh, what this chart shows you is our current uh, forecasts um, is actually that it should be from January 2013, not uh, not 2012. So we update every quarter, and we will be updating again soon. But it shows you our uh, 2011 growth, our estimates at the moment for 2012. Some of these numbers are provisional and, and subject to change, and our current forecast for for 2013. The, the countries above the line are those that still manage some growth in, in 2012, uh, although with the exception of Kosovo and, and to a lesser extent Albania, it was pretty minimal. Uh, the ones below the line are those that had negative growth last year, and, and uh, <coughs> Croatia and Serbia both were around minus 2%. Um, so in every case, growth in 2012 was below 2011. So whereas in 2011, we seem to have a... a um, you know, a bit of a recovery taking place. 2011, uh, 2012 was a very, uh, a very difficult year. Now, for 2013, we do have a, a, you know, we've penciled in a positive number in in each case, but it's it's you know it's it's well below I think what the potential of the region is. It's we're talking about typically one, one to two percent, or or maybe less than one percent in in some cases, with a lot of downside. Risks, so don't be too surprised if <coughs> later in the year you check the EBRD website and you see our forecasts. Um, let, let me put it this way: they're more likely to move in a downward direction than than uh, an upward direction. So it's just it's hard to see really strong growth drivers anywhere in uh, in, in this region. And one of the reasons uh, I think uh, uh, an explanation for that, but also a reflection of it, is the lack of confidence. So in some countries we have uh, monthly consumer and business surveys. Um, it tends to be the EU members, so Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Croatia, of course, which is about to uh, join. Uh, for business confidence we also have Macedonia. On the right-hand side we have Albania, which I've put separately because it's a different uh, methodology. But what I, would, uh, what I would emphasize in these charts are uh, the weakness of consumer confidence. That's the upper left chart there, um, and the, the the blue or if it's blue or green line on the top. That's the EU average. So uh, consumer confidence is not very high in the EU, not surprisingly as a whole, but it's even lower in Bulgaria and Romania and uh, and Croatia. Looking at business confidence down on the uh, the lower left hand. Um, quadrant uh, there, it's a bit more mixed. Uh, it's you know, it's 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 um, it's below the long term trend, but it's uh, not that different actually from the EU average. If you can disentangle those different lines, and Albania uh, both are on a, uh, a downward trend at present. So Albania is a country that managed to escape the worst effects of the crisis, but I think is nevertheless in in. Uh, in, in quite some economic difficulties as as uh, as well, <clears throat> so that's the that's the background. It's um, a bit of a gloomy story. And now, let me take you through uh, some charts that highlight some of the points from the uh, the chapters. Now, in the first chapter, one of the <clears throat> this is by Boris Stegovic from the uh, University of Belgrade. Uh, one of the points he emphasizes is the. Uh, the role of vested interests, that um, vested interests throughout the economy and throughout society remain very powerful in, in Serbia and in, in the wider southeastern uh, European region. And they, that can be a big deterrent to reform and investment mm -hmm. and, and growth. So to illustrate that, you can, you can look at uh, where countries stand on the uh, Transparency International's um, corruption perception index and um, this index f may be familiar to some of you it ranges from 0 to 100 so 100 would be basically no corruption 0 would be uh, complete and utter corruption you can see um, there's relatively minor variation in the region and the scores 
uh, countries get Croatia comes out best, um, Albania and Kosovo uh, look the worst, but all are well behind the OECD uh, uh, average. So it's one way, I think, of illustrating this problem of this political economy problem of, of corruption and uh, and we know from numerous academic studies that corruption is is uh, a serious barrier to investment and uh, investment and, and growth. Now, the second chapter is the one that I wrote with uh, my colleague Simone Zay, and uh, it's uh, it's about competitiveness. And what we're trying to do in this chapter is to. Um, assess how competitive the region is on, on a number of different indicators, indicators of uh, business environment, quality of infrastructure, state of reforms, and, and so on. And it's partly, part of the reason for writing that chapter was expository. There are many different indices out there which purport to measure some aspect of of competitiveness or the business environment or, or reforms and, and what we're trying to do is explain what these different indicators mean uh, and, and, and what sort of uh, what sort of judgments one should infer from the from the scores uh, so it's it's an eclectic eclectic mix of different indicators this one is from the uh, World Economic Forum it's the global competitiveness index again the higher the score the the better uh, and you see um, very little variation within the region. Bulgaria uh, stands out on, on top. Serbia and Albania and Bosnia uh, all uh, scoring least well. Uh, but again, on the right-hand side, you see the average for the, uh, the OECD, which is significantly above uh, the regional average. So uh, the region, this region, the southeastern Europe is lagging behind. Why? Well, uh, we think it's partly because of... Uh, institutional gaps and, and, and gaps in, in structural reforms. And, and on this chart, I'm showing something from the EBRD transition report, which perhaps I can wave as well. Uh, again, probably a familiar publication to many of you, our annual assessment of um, e the economy and, and the state of reforms across the whole EBRD region, um, published every year in November. Uh, within this volume, you will see uh, an assessment for each country of the state of reforms across 16 different sectors of the uh, economy. And what we have is a scoring system which goes from 1 to uh, 4 plus, with, with, or 4.33, with 4.33 being the, 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 the highest score. Now, this is done just for the transition countries, so the comparator here on the left-hand side is the uh, the average for Central Europe and the Baltics, and uh, and then you see where our countries stand in our countries in, in southeastern Europe. So Romania, Croatia, and Bulgaria being not that far short of the Central European Baltic average, and then there's quite a big drop when you come to the um, the rest of the countries with uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, bringing up the bringing up the rear. So that I think is one reason why southeastern Europe is not as competitive as it could be. And the other, uh, another reason is the uh, quality of the business environment. And for this, we, uh, we have borrowed from the World's, World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. It's another index that's published annually. It assesses ease of doing business according to different criteria for pretty much every country in the world, or at least 183 <laughs> Uh, countries and uh, one country stands out very well here and that's Macedonia which is actually ranked higher than the average for OECD countries so uh, Macedonia for all its problems and all its difficulties it has made over the years a concerted effort to actually you know introduce concrete reforms to the business environment but the other countries you see lagging uh, well behind and again Bosnia and Herzegovina is the one that uh, stands out as uh, the most difficult place to do business according to this particular uh, measure. Now, I can show you a number of other charts uh, from the chapter, but I think the point that the point has been made that, that uh, there is a problem in the region with competitiveness, with the state of reforms, and with the quality of the, the, the business environment. So this, these are the things that need to be tackled. Now, chapter three is by to uh, IMF 
authors, and what they focus on is uh, is trade and, and trade openness, and they, they particularly look at the uh, export performance of the region. And what they show is that this performance has been well below what you might expect for countries at this level of uh, development. Now, again, there can be many reasons for this, and some of them are partly a historical legacy of the breakup of Yugoslavia in the early 1990s and, and the problems that that created in, in that decade. But uh, I think it also has to do with just the, the general difficulties of trading across borders. And this is another indicator that the World Bank examines each year in their doing business uh, assessment and, and publishes statistics on. And again, you can see, um, you can see how the countries rank in relation to the OECD average. This is a ranking of countries, so the, the lower the score, the better the ranking. So number one would be the best, 183 would be the worst in the world, and you see each country in the region lagging behind the, uh, the OECD average. So there is a fundamental problem, and, and indeed it's visible to the naked eye if you travel around the region by, by road, you can see visibly the problems on, on the borders and the problems of, uh, 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 of doing business with, with neighbouring countries. There has been progress over the years. There is indeed a regional free trade agreement for those countries not yet in the uh, European Union, but there's a lot, lot more to be done to uh, achieve progress. Uh, now, Chapter 4 is uh, about financial financial sector and financial intermediation. So this chart <clears throat> highlights how, how steep has been the decline in, uh, in credit growth to the, to the private sector. So in the pre-crisis period, so early 2008, you had very high credit booms pretty much across the board. The one country that stands out here particularly is uh, that one with 160% credit growth back in 2008 is Montenegro. But other countries are having credit growth in the order of 40-50% uh, a year. So it's not surprising when you look back at it. I mean, here was a region where banks, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, banks by and large were not really trusted. People didn't want to keep their money in banks. Banks served no useful function as a provider of credit to uh, businesses. And so foreign banks in particular saw an opportunity. They saw a, a region with potential a region that, to a large extent, put behind the political problems of the 1990s, and one where uh, there was really an opportunity to go in and do business and, and make money. So foreign banks poured in. Uh, they started making credit available to people. People started trusting banks more, and they also started borrowing more because they felt more confident about the future, and you had a big credit boom. Now, in the past few years, that has all, to some extent, gone into uh, reverse. So uh, credit growth now is bumping along marginally positive in some countries, marginally negative in other words. In real terms, so when you adjust for inflation, it's actually negative in uh, most countries. So banks are, to use the jargon word, they're deleveraging, they're, they're, they're cutting back on their, their, um, their lending and, and, and they're much more reluctant to lend than they were before. Uh, why? Well, one reason is um, because of this, these credit booms, which was then followed by a, a severe recession in, in most countries, there's a big overhang now of non-performing loans. What this chart shows is the uh, percentage of loan books in the banking system that are non-performing. Uh, bad, bad debts, basically. Uh, it's um, above 10% in, in all cases except Kosovo, Interestingly, although even in Kosovo they're, they're, they're starting to rise fairly sharply now, and they're around 20% or even above in, in a couple of cases, Serbia and uh, Albania in, in, in particular. So, so this is a this is a problem. How are we going to how are banks going to deal with these loans? Are they going to write them off? Are they going to try and sell them off to NPL servicing companies? What can be done to solve this problem? Not an easy one to do, but I think it it has to be has to be tackled head-on before banks will be willing, uh, willing to lend again. Now, the final chapter is... Uh, this is the one by um, 
the, so I should have said the financial sector one is written by Fikret Charshevich from the University of Sarajevo. The final chapter is written by Governor Fulani and Alton Tanku from the Bank of Albania. And it looks at more broadly at uh, regional cooperation and foreign direct uh, investment. And, and this chart that I'm putting up here, um, we don't have 2012 data yet, so I've, what I'm comparing here is the average foreign direct investment inflow during the five years before the crisis, 2004 to 2008, compared with the average from 2009 to 2011. And uh, in most cases, it's been a, a steep drop. Bulgaria and Romania, the, the chart is truncated. You can see the actual figures uh, uh, there is about a little over $7 billion a year in Bulgaria in the pre-crisis boom years, more than nine billion a year in Romania. Now it's down to two, a little over two billion in Bulgaria and about three billion in in Romania in the, the three years of the crisis. Let's say 2009 to to 2011. Um, so. Uh, so the region is finding it hard to attract foreign investment, and I think that is a uh, is a really big problem, because um, of course, in principle, domestic investment could step up and take up the opportunities, but the resources for domestic investment are still quite limited. So I think southeastern Europe is a region that still needs not just the funds that come from foreign investment, but also the the expertise the new products, the new skills, the new ways of, of, of doing things that are associated with, uh, with at least a good, good foreign in, in investment. And in a global environment when investment, foreign inve investor appetite is, is limited, I think this hammers home the point that the region has to do more to uh, make itself attractive to, uh, to foreign investors. In the pre-crisis boom years, it was relatively easy to get foreign investment. There were a lot of things to sell, and uh, and you could also sell a good story that the economies were growing quickly, and and you could say, well, this is a region that's really on the up. Now it's it's much harder to sell us to to sell that story, and there are fewer attractive actual assets to sell. There are fewer things to privatize, so you have to make more effort to get more greenfield uh, investment, and that is. What Ardian and Fellani and Alton Tanku emphasize is the importance, therefore, of more regional cooperation to try and make the region more attractive to investors and not just individual, individual countries. So coming to some conclusions, and then perhaps we can open up the, the, the discussion. Um, I think there are four, maybe, that I've, I've, I've picked out. Um, one being, uh, I think, a lesson that is well understood now, that uh, the, the pre-crisis growth model in southeastern Europe was, it was unbalanced and it was ultimately un, unsustainable because it relied on cheap bank money, credit booms, cheap capital inflows, and, and that, those things are not going to come back anytime uh, soon. Now, the second conclusion is, uh, and it comes through in some of the, the chapters, um, the, the European Union's anchor role for reforms. It's still, I think, very important. And in fact, we, 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 we say in the introduction that ultimately it's irreplaceable. These countries need the European Union perspective. And indeed, they are slowly but, but surely making progress towards that goal. Croatia, uh, it, it, just yesterday, they got the you know, final green light from the European uh, Commission positive report. They are ready to join on July 1st, and they will, I think we can safely say now, join on, on July 1st. And other countries, by and large, are making steps forward in, uh, in this process. But the, the, the anchor role of the EU as a, as, a, as a guide to reforms, and indeed the attractiveness of the EU, has uh, diminished in, in, in recent years. Now, that leads really to the third point, that uh, I think the, the crisis was a bit of a wake-up call for the region. 
one good thing that can come out of crisis is that they uh, they can lead to a, a greater effort to reforms, which reforms that will then put in place something more sustainable and that's less prone to crisis in in the future. But it has to really come from domestic bottom up support rather than than top down. And the final conclusion is that. Um, if the region can sell itself as a genuine one regional economic space, or at least the more it can do that, then the more chance it has of attracting foreign investment and, and, and ultimately promoting economic growth. I'm, I'm still confident that will happen in the long term, but it's going to take quite some time to, to get there. Good. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes, well, thank you.